Today we're going to continue our exploration of the great Renaissance composers. One of the most prolific of the time was Giovanni Pierluigi Palestrina. He was a great Italian Renaissance master. And in fact, at that time, the Italian Renaissance composers attained the same level of mastery of counterpoint as their Flemish counterparts. Previously, we discussed the great Flemish composer Josquet de Pere. Now we're going to look at Palestrina. His music is unique in its serenity, in its clarity. For a long time during Palestrina's era, there had been a growing discontent. Uh, this was in fact the time of the Counter-Reformation. The Protestant movement had taken hold and the Catholic Church felt that it needed to examine its shortcomings. And one of the issues that they looked at was church music. Palestrina lived during this time and he was subjected to the scrutiny of the Council of Trent. They complained that music had become theatrical, it was just a murmuring of voices, like the unheard of during the, the era of the Greeks and the Romans. Their theatre was less pretentious. This was seen to be contrary to what church music should be. They wanted serenity, they wanted clarity, and in fact there was even a call for the return to Gregorian chant. And the legend is, although this is now disputed, that Palestrina saved polyphony in church music. That one of his famous works, the Missa Papa Marcelli, in fact convinced the Council of Trent that polyphony could work in church music, that it did not obscure the clarity of the words. Palestrina had a prolific career in Rome. He was born, in fact, in a place called Palestrina outside Rome. And uh, he served as a, first as a choir boy, as an organist in, in Palestrina. And in Rome, he was a prolific choir master for uh, the Julian Cathedral, uh, which was in St. Peter's, and, and in other famous churches in Rome, such as St. John of Lateran. Palestrina, his music was seen to be, uh, it was on the same level as the Flemish counterparts. But at the same time, it achieved a greater degree of clarity and of balance and of elegance. For instance, if there's a leap in the music, Palestrina immediately corrects it by a downward movement. He manages to create variety through varying the texture. Uh, at the beginning of an exposition, there might be a few voices and then he'll increase the number of voices and offset a larger chorus against a smaller one for variety. He achieved textual variety, as we said, in voices, in terms of his melody, in terms of his harmony. So while on the one hand his harmonic language was simple, he achieved a great degree of interest in his writing. And to this day, his style of polyphonic writing serves as a model for students of, of counterpoint. When one looks at the famous treatise uh, Gradus Ad Parnassum by Johann Fuchs, written in the 1700s, Fuchs actually looked back to the time of Palestrina and distilled his principles of dissonance treatment of contrapuntal writing. We're going to look at one of Palestrina's most famous works, as we mentioned, his Missa Papa Marcelli, which he dedicated to the Pope of the time. Uh, it is considered to be one of the most serene and beautiful works of all time in terms of its balance, in terms of its ability to inspire contemplation. And we're going to see how Palestrina achieves this, this level of balance, his perfection in writing. We're going to explore some of the movements from his Missa Papa Marcelli. But it should be noted that as the centuries grew and as time passed, Palestrina's reputation became greater and greater, so much so that he was considered already to be a hero in the, in the history of music by the, the 1800s. And in, in a certain sense, he is in fact the father of all Western music. He laid down the ideals of polyphonic writing, homophonic writing. Everything that ensued afterwards goes back to Palestrina. Even Bach and all the great masters, they owe everything essentially to Palestrina. The fugue wouldn't have come about were it not for Palestrina's um, pioneering work in the world of polyphonic imitation. 
So a lot of credit is owed to Palestrina. We're going to look at his Mr. Papa Machin. Palestrina was named after his birthplace, a small town near Rome by the same name. He served as a choir boy and received his musical education at the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. After seven years as an organist and choir master in Palestrina, he returned to Rome under the patronage of Pope Julius III. He spent most of his career as a choir master at the Julian Chapel at St. Peter's and several other churches in Rome. He wrote more masses than any other composer. Palestrina's Missa Papa Marcelli is his most famous work. He dedicated it to Pope Marcellus II, who reigned in 1555. He set it for an a cappella choir of six voice parts, soprano, alto, two tenors and two basses. Here you can hear the beginning of the Kyrie. It has a polyphonic texture and uses constant imitation. Despite this, the voice parts blend perfectly. Palestrina balances upward leaps with downward steps. The Kyrie has three sections, Kyrie Eleison 1, Christa Eleison and Kyrie Eleison 2. The words are repeated with different melodic lines. The rhythm flows to the end of each section when all the voices come together on sustained chords. Here you can hear the beginning of the Christe Eleison. Each of the sections begins in a thin texture. Following this, other voices enter. Here you can hear the beginning of the Kyrie Eleison 2. Palestrina prioritizes intelligibility of the words. His style can be described as an elegant and uncutted polyphony. He is sensitive to the text. 
while striving for clarity in his writing, he achieves variety in melody, rhythm, texture and sonority. Palestrina's music became a model for later church music and counterpoint in the strict style.